Okay, so we've seen that cities left unchecked tend to sprawl themselves out indiscriminately like some kind of armpit rash after three days of camping with no showers. And that's just a hypothetical example. Like, <laughs> that would be really gross if it, you know, <laughs> happened to me. Anyway, uncontained urban sprawl is a problem, but not to worry, this video is all about the initiatives toward urban sustainability that have arisen to address that problem. So if you're ready to get them brain cows milked, let's get to it. All right, so what in the fresh heck do we mean when we talk about urban sustainability? Well, it refers to using resources necessary to create a livable urban society in a way that those resources continue to be available for future generations. Now remember that we've already established that cities are resource hogs in general since so many dang people live in them. And that has serious implications for the size of a city's ecological footprint, which refers to the amount of land required to support a given population's use of natural resources. And let me just try to explain that simply. Let's just say for poops and giggles that a single person needs the natural resources found in one acre of land in order to survive. Now that one acre has all the water and timber and soil, et cetera, that that person needs to have a good life. Okay, so that means that two people will need two acres, three people will need three acres, and so on. And supposing all of those people use that land in a way that it replenishes its resources year after year, then everybody is happy and lives pretty good. But then suppose that those people get tired of being isolated and get together to build a city. Now they all live on this one acre of land and start building, and as it turns out, their city takes up the whole acre. But wait a minute, there are five people, and we've already established that they need five acres of land to survive, and look at that, now they only have four acres that supply their natural resources. And then if the population starts to increase and the built environment of the city starts to expand, then there is less land to provide what they need to live. And eventually they might run themselves into a Malthus style apocalypse because they've run short on resources. And you know, that can be kind of a bummer. Oh, and by the way, if you want note guys to follow along with this video and all my videos, check the link in the description. Anyway, what we just saw in a very simplified form is what is actually happening in major urban areas. Their ecological footprint is growing with so many more people to keep alive and that means a greater strain on the resources of the land, not to mention a lot of nasty pollution that makes life in the cities more than a little rough. So all that to say, cities tend to be hard on their environments and resources. So city planners have devised several design initiatives to help keep cities sustainable. So let's have a look at a few of them that you need to know. So the first sustainable initiative you need to know falls under the heading of smart growth policies. Now these are initiatives from urban planners that combat urban sprawl by emphasizing environmental protection and compact walkable neighborhoods with abundant public transportation. Now these policies try to combat the threats of urban sprawl in essentially four ways. First is an emphasis on mixed land use, which means they create neighborhoods with diverse functions, mixing residential, entertainment, and business development so that residents can live, play, and work without the need of car-based transportation. And if you want another term for that, and I know that you do, geographers often refer to this as transportation-oriented development. Second, smart growth policies strive to create walkable neighborhoods. To that end, streets and sidewalks are laid out to make walking both convenient and safe. So you can begin to see that one of the major problems in urban areas is the positive glut of cars, and that's obvious to anyone with two eyes and a pulse. Like, I live north of Atlanta, and I swear, anytime I have to drive through the city, like, it does not matter the day or the time, I'll be crawling along the connector. And yeah, that's annoying, but even more to the point, all those cars are spewing exhaust into the environment. And in the biggest cities, all that pollution can create smog, which is about as healthy for your lungs as huffing the smoke from a campfire made of cow turds. So smart growth policies do their best to reduce the number of cars necessary for urban living. Anyway, third, smart growth policies emphasize diverse housing options. Remember in the last video when we talked about the trend over the last century, particularly in American cities, for sprawl to encourage racial and socioeconomic division in the population? Well, to combat that trend, smart growth policies strive to create neighborhoods that offer housing for people of many different income levels and stages of life. And then fourth, smart growth policies emphasize protection of the natural environment. And the idea here is to build urban housing and infrastructure with the environment in mind instead of against it, which means protecting outlying agricultural land from further sprawl. Okay, now the second sustainability initiative you need to know is known as new urbanism. And this has similar goals to smart growth cities, but instead focuses on the smaller scale of the neighborhood itself to create European style neighborhoods with dense populations. So here you do have some overlap with smart growth policies, namely the desire for walkability and mixed land use. But there are two emphases that are unique to new urbanism. First is the desire for quality architecture. So to combat the cookie cutter blandness of suburban housing, which often leads to a sense of placelessness, new urbanist architecture emphasizes beauty and variations of scale. And then the fourth feature of new urbanism is smart transportation, which is to say they emphasize the necessity of high quality public transportation for long distance travel as opposed to using cars. And the classic example of this movement is Seaside Florida. Now notice the narrowness of the streets, which make it difficult for driving, but marvelous for walking. Additionally, all the buildings and houses feel like they fit together as part of a planned urban tapestry. Okay, the third sustainability initiative to know is the creation of green belts, also known as green spaces in North America, which happen to be a common 
center of both smart growth policies and new urbanism. So green belts refer to a circular area of trees or forests or agricultural land that surrounds a city and acts as a formal barrier between urban and rural areas. Not only do green belts satisfy the goals of sustainability by creating places for urban people to enjoy nature, but they also absorb the carbon dioxide generated by cities. Additionally, because of zoning laws, green belts cannot be built upon and thus create a natural barrier for urban sprawl. Now, this initiative was first developed in England in the 20th century, and today the green belt that surrounds London includes over a million acres of undeveloped land, which has indeed checked the sprawl of the city. And then the final sustainability initiative you need to know is known as slow growth cities, which refer to urban areas that use zoning laws to slow the rate of urban sprawl. So remember that zoning laws determine exactly how a particular piece of land can be used. For example, if land is zoned as residential, then you can't build a factory on it, only homes. So city governments with limited resources often make use of zoning laws to contain the horizontal spread of cities. And by changing the legal use of a land from, for example, agricultural to residential, city planners can build high-density residence buildings which can combat the negative effects of sprawl. For example, the municipal government of Boulder, Colorado has limited building permits and created an urban growth boundary which creates a sharp line between urban and rural areas. And in doing so, residents have been able to check sprawl and maintain a sense of the place where they live. Okay, so all that sounds real cheery and all, but the responses to these initiatives have been, uh, mixed. On the positive side, in some communities that have adopted sustainable policies, the goals of walkability, reduced sprawl, better transportation, diverse housing, and improved quality of life have been achieved. You can see this in places like Portland, Oregon, and Seaside, Florida. But there have also been quite a few naysayers as well. Let's hear some of their criticisms. And those problems can basically be summed up thusly. Sustainable initiatives often don't live up to their lofty promises and end up creating new problems as they try to solve the old problems. So one problem created by these initiatives is increased housing costs. For example, green belts limit the amount of land on which urban building can occur, and as land becomes more scarce, that necessarily drives up the cost of land and housing within the bounds of urban areas. And that reality will make housing unaffordable to lower income residents, the very problem they were trying to solve with their fancy urban planning. So going back to Seaside, because this has become such a desirable area to live or more to the point to vacation, the housing prices have skyrocketed and thus only the wealthy can really afford to own property there. Okay, a second major criticism involves the possibility of de facto segregation, which refers to racial segregation that is not supported by law but still occurs because of people's choices. You see, critics of sustainable initiatives worry that as housing prices increase, low income minorities will be pushed out of these developments, which has been a problem of urban living for decades. And that problem is known as gentrification, but we'll save that for another video. And then the third major criticism of these initiatives is the potential loss of historical or place character. In other words, many of the new urbanist and smart growth designs are kind of similar to each other and they're applied to different areas without consideration for the character of the place itself. And these standardized designs can feel artificial, especially when they remove or transform historical buildings to fit within the design. Well, okay, click here to keep reviewing for Unit 6 and click here to grab my video note guides, which will help you get all the contents of this course firmly crammed into your brain folds. And I'll catch you on the flip-flop. I'm Lerout.